Hello, a very warm good morning to all of you and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to today's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis, where we shall be analyzing today's The Hindu Newspaper, the Delhi edition of The Hindu Newspaper. And we shall be taking a look at few of the topics which are relevant for your examination, both for your prelims as well as for your mains examination. And at the end of it all, we shall also be taking up a couple of questions with regards to how you can approach the main questions or the main types of questions which can be asked from this particular topic. Now, before moving ahead into the topics that we are going to discuss, a couple of announcements, so to say. So, first of all, all of you who are going to look at this particular analysis, I would suggest, recommend and advise all of you that after this analysis is done, kindly go to the Telegram channel and take up the test with regards to the multiple choice questions which can be framed from this topic so that at least you get an idea about how you can prepare or what kind of questions can be asked from this particular area. And having said that, the link and the description for the Telegram channel shall be present in the description below. Now, furthermore, we are going to conduct a workshop with regards to when is the right time to start the preparation for civil services. And that is the workshop which is going to be conducted on 18th of March. It will be conducted by Samad sir and it will be at 6 p.m. on Baiju's exam prep app. So all those who are interested in knowing how to initiate the preparation and how to plan your preparation accordingly when you start, you are supposed to attend this workshop and it is a kind of a workshop which will significantly add value to your preparation journey. Now, the description for the details of the workshop will again be provided below the video. Now, let us take a look at the topics that we are going to discuss today. So today, we are going to discuss in total around eight topics. Out of the, those four topics shall be typically concentrated around prelims keeping in mind the prelims examination of 2023, which is fast approaching. And then four other topics are there which have appeared in the editorial as well as the open pages and thereby we shall be discussing them in elaborate detail. Now, here, the first topic that we are going to discuss is the sharp divides. This has appeared in page six, the editorial page of the Delhi edition. And this talks about the AUKUS. Now, yesterday also in the news headline, there was the aspect of how AUKUS has started developing a submarine force which shall be deployed in the Indo-Pacific. So this article which has appeared in the editorial analyzes the implications of it, whether it will create a global divide or not. So this is again very relevant for your paper 3, that is IR. Okay. Then, Brahmapuram as a policy game changer for Kerala. Here Brahmapuram refers to the case of the Kochi landfill which caught fire. Again, it is a follow-up story with regards to the Kochi land, uh, landfill fire which has erupted, which had created a kind of a gas chamber in the region around Kochi. Many people have been impacted by that. So how is it that a policy decision can be taken with regards to that? What are the lacunae that we are facing both at the sides of the public and at the side of the policy makers? Again, this is going to be relevant for your paper three. Then, China, India and the promise of the power of two. So this is an optimistic piece of article which has appeared in the editorial and this talks about the importance of strengthening the relationship between China and India and how each one of them can extract something out of each other and thereby lead to the dawn of a new century which we can call as the Asian century. So the rise of the Asian supergiants as we can call it. So again, this is important for your IR. So again, for paper two. And then we have a detailed page in the Hindu newspaper on page 8 where there is a discussion for the reservation of women and how it is important to have that reservation in the legislative bodies, in the local bodies and what has been the journey till now. So that is again something we shall be discussing in detail. And for the prelims perspective, we shall be holding discussions with regards to the Eurasian Otter Raises Hope for Jammu and Kashmir stream. So you have the Niru stream of Chinab River 
and that Nehru stream basically gives you an idea and the presence of these otters in that stream gives you an idea that the water is still clean in that region. So what is the significance of that? We will cover it very briefly from the prelims perspective. Then journalist wins Chameli Devi award. So what this award is, very briefly you need to know. Then resolution in US Senate on MacMohan line. So this is one of the first steps, so to say, taken by the international community to provide recognition to the MacMohan line. And if this resolution passes through or moves through, then MacMohan line may be considered as the international border. And that in itself will be a huge milestone when it comes to Indo-China border issues. Then the PM Mitra scheme, again important for your prelims perspective with regards to the textile parks and the establishment of textile parks and what are the five F's of this Mitra scheme. So all these we are going to analyze in detail as we move ahead. So without further ado, let us take a look at each of these topics. So we will start with the aspect of the sharp divide. This has appeared in page six of the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. And this is a kind of a follow-up story to what we had discussed yesterday. Yesterday, what is it that we had discussed? We had discussed about AUKUS. And in fact, in yesterday's news article, you would find that there was a significant aspect about AUKUS. And that is Australia, UK, as well as United States. They came together on a platform and they discussed the probability and the possibility of developing a submarine force which could be deployed in the region of Indo-Pacific and thereby Australia could emerge as one of the net security providers in the region of the Indo-Pacific. Now this AUKUS, the entire grouping, which for the first time was mooted somewhere in around September 2021, at that point of time, AUKUS was designated or designed or a grouping which came together for the development of submarines. And it was very particular with that aspect. Now you have to understand that submarine design and development is a very complicated piece of engineering. It is not something that any Tom, Dick and Harry can achieve. Very few countries in the world have the capacity and the capability to be able to develop their own submarines. Now, under this AUKUS program, basically, United States and UK, they have agreed to collaborate with Australia and thereby strengthen the submarine force in Australia. Now, when these three parties, they came together, they signed a deal to develop stealthy or stealth nuclear submarines okay or what is also referred to as SSN now overall the budgeted cost of this entire project is going to be somewhere around 368 billion US dollars now here when we talk about nuclear submarines, I hope we are able to understand that nuclear submarines does not mean that it is able to fire nuclear weapons. It just means those sub particular class of submarines which run on nuclear power and nuclear technology. Basically, the submarines also need some amount of energy to function. Now, thereby, you have various different types of submarines. You have diesel electric, the conventional ones, and then you have the nuclear submarines. India has also managed to develop nuclear submarines. And under that project, that is where we had developed the class of submarines, which we refer to as the Arihant class of submarines. So that is the class of nuclear submarines. Now, here, when we use the term stealth, this is basically a special design of submarines which makes it very, very difficult for the submarine to be detected underwater. Without going into the depth of the technology which is involved in the development of this, here you have to understand that this collaboration talks about the inculcation of US technology along with the British design. It is in fact the US technology for the development of stealth submarines which is world famous and renowned all across the world. So, when you have the submarines lurking underwater, basically, 
these submarines they run on propeller blades right fan like rotors which run underwater now these propeller blades they will generate bubbles as the submarine moves isn't it so if suppose this is the water and this is where a submarine is functioning so basically this is how the propeller blades run and they will generate these bubbles now these bubbles when they burst that is how the submarines create noise and they are detected so the very design of a stealth submarine is based on the fact that you are able to eliminate these bubbles and you are able to make this a stealthy design but then this development of submarine will it be deployed in the region of united states uk or will it be deployed in australia so the purpose is that it shall be deployed in australia because this AUKUS grouping actually eyes China as the main power or the aggressor in the region of Indo-Pacific. And that is why they are wary of the growing power of China. Now, providing these nuclear submarines with Australia and to Australia, that will provide a kind of a strategic advantage where these submarines can continuously lurk in the region of the Pacific or in the Indian Ocean and thereby they can be able to counter the Chinese threat. The very perspective of designing a nuclear submarine is that these submarines can remain underwater almost indefinitely because the fuel never runs out. They will have to come above water. Why? In order to restock for food and also for crew member changes, etc. Otherwise, they can keep uh, themselves submerged for prolonged duration of time. And that is what gives the countries with very unique strategic advantage. This has got countries like China riled up and China basically has issued a diktat and a kind of a warning as well that this grouping and development of the program of these submarines, that is a dangerous path that the countries are treading because it can lead to an adverse military alliance and it can again lead to the division of various different powers of the world. And that is what this article talks about, a kind of a sharp divide now here basically this agreement which has been arrived by these countries this agreement has got three different phases what are the three different phases so in the first phase the us and uk navies they will get the australian navy personnel with them the australian navy personnel shall be working with them and thereby they shall get trained in the handling of these submarines because it is not like a new car that you directly buy from the showroom and maybe in a couple of days you get uh, very professional in driving the car it is a nuclear submarine it is a very complicated machinery so you need a good large chunk of time for training the naval personnel as well you good you need a good amount of time to train the people how to maintain that submarine how to take care of any shortages which erupt and emerge so that is where there shall be the first phase of training of the australian navy personnel then after that the us and uk nuclear submarines will travel rotationally to australia and the us will sell australia up to five nuclear powered virginia class submarines virginia class it is a category of submarine just like in india we have the arihant class submarines the, the same way you have the virginia class submarines of united states which is a significantly large one and there again you have various different types virginia class then ohio class submarines and so on this virginia class submarine is known for its stealth features and it is nuclear powered now why is it that these submarines will be traveling to australian coastlines frequently the purpose here is simple the purpose is so that there is a continuous deterrence which is maintained in the region of indo-pacific so that when these submarines they do the rounds in the region thereby you can have that deterrence patrol and thereby it can put a check to the aggressive nature of China's expansionist policy and at the same time it will give the naval personnel of these three countries a very good idea about how to interoperate the machineries, how to carry out regular maintenances and how to take care of these submarines on the Australian shores. So that is why this will be in place. Now, 
this will be in place till United States starts supplying these Virginia class submarines. After that, the visit is supposed to taper down and Australia's naval submarine force is supposed to increase. Then, a new submarine called SSN AUKUS will be built and used by all three navies with interoperable workings. So this is a new category of submarines. It is not the existing submarine which will be bought by Australia. After this Virginia class is supplied, another new category of submarines, particularly for the region, particularly for the demand of the region, that is something which shall be developed. Okay. Now here SSN means what? SSN basically refers to ship submersible nuclear. It is a terminology used by the naval forces across the world, SSN and SSBN. So SSBNs that you hear about, SSBNs here B stands for ballistic. So these are the ones which are capable of launching nuclear weapons, right? Whereas SSNs, they will have the normal conventional warheads. They will have the normal missile systems which cannot carry nuclear weapons, but they will be powered by nuclear technology. So that is something which shall be developed by these nations. Then the challenges as viewed by AUKUS. If you take a look at what are the challenges that AUKUS views at when it looks at Asia Pacific? Basically, first thing is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has basically alarmed almost all the countries of the world. And thereby, as you could observe in the recently released CIPRI report as well, the arms import in the region of Europe has shot up incrementally. And it is under that mindset and under that approach whereby you would observe that even United Kingdom currently is debating whether they are investing enough for their defense forces. And that is why it is a kind of an incentive for the United Kingdom as well to invest heavily and design these special class of submarines which can be deployed very far away from their shores. Then the China's growing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific including claims over Taiwan and this has riled up many people and China as we have consistently reiterated has got an expansionist and an aggressive foreign policy and that is where the designs that is something which is fe feared by Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines, all the countries in the region they are significantly suffering at the hands of this expansionist policy so that needs to be brought to a check. Then destabilizing behavior as indicated by Iran and North Korea further can exacerbate the threat in the case of Iran in the Indian Ocean region, in the case of North Korea in the Pacific region. So both Iran and North Korea taken together, that is where the Indo-Pacific is viewed as a threat, as a challenge by these AUKUS nations and that is why this step has been taken. Now then, what is the global response when this 368 billion dollars of agreement has been arrived at and has been reached what is the global response for it so the global response is basically very simple and as per expected lines while majority of the countries like indonesia and so on they are completely silent on the issue but then there has been a vehement and a sharp retort, particularly from China. And Russia, again, does not view it in a positive line. Even though this entire grouping of AUKUS is not primarily aimed at Russia, it is primarily aimed at China. But then, Russia, China being a good ally, that is where both of them, they are against. And in fact, the Chinese foreign ministry yesterday had issued a sharp statement that this is a dangerous pup. So they are completely against. Now what about India? What has been the response that India has given? So India has largely been silent on the issue. And that is because of a particular reason. Now in this entire area, India has also been able to form a grouping that we refer to as Quad. Right? A grouping of Japan, Australia, India and United States. But as you would be observing and as you would already know that 
by the process of this squad there is a cooperation which has developed in these countries but there has not been a defense posturing that these countries are doing so it is a kind of a non-military alliance till now the quad but then india is also very and india is also significantly alarmed by the uh, expansionist tendencies indicated by china so for india it is a kind of a welcome step that india does not want to overtly appreciate but nonetheless india is not at all against this and for india it is something which is not going to do a harm but India sees it as a kind of a strategic advantage in the Indo-Pacific. But then, here one thing we have to understand. Why is it that we are discussing this topic is because of the reason that when you have these military alliances, rarely can these military alliances lead to a lasting peace. In most of the cases, military alliances lead to a rising conflict scenario as well. You can take the case of NATO. Now the formation of NATO in itself was carried out in order to put a check to Russia. Now observe what is happening. You have NATO versus Russia which has been playing out across the world in various different angles and in various different perspectives. There is a fear amongst the global think tanks that something on a very similar level, something on a very similar scale can happen in the Indo-Pacific with the development of AUKUS. Because the countries which are friendly with China, they will never join AUKUS. They will never welcome this step by AUKUS. But then those countries which are friendly with United States, for example, Japan, for example, South Korea, they might welcome this step again, leading to polarization in the world. And that can never lead to lasting peace. So that is why, while this is something which is monumental, but at the same time, time we have to tread cautiously we have to move very very cautiously just so as to ensure that it does not lead to another version of cold war erupting in between various regional groups okay now then we move on to the second topic right how india sandeep how india would be affected to china this agreement so india would be basically impacted sandeep in the sense that in the case of Indian Ocean, India already views itself as a net security provider, right? So in the Indian Ocean, Indian Navy is the most dominant and the powerful Navy which is present there. Time and time again, Chinese Navy, which is growing at an incredible fast pace, that makes incursions into the region around Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. Now, thereby, if the Australian Navy is able to provide a kind of a check in the region around Malacca Strait or in the region of South China Sea, that in itself will, in a significant way, lessen the workload of the Indian Navy when it comes to detecting the Chinese vessels and Chinese aggression. And why India is not in this, Shamal? Again, the reason is very simple. That is, when you have India openly declaring a military alliance that can never be good for our immediate neighbor and neighboring relations because you have to understand one thing at the end of the day neither the united states nor the united kingdom nor australia none of them they share a boundary with china we do so we cannot enter into an open military alliance against china that is why we have entered into an alliance in the form of quad which is in a way a strategic alliance and Muskan, the term class of submarines basically refers to, for example, you have a set of design, a kind of a design which has been finalized, and you have a series of submarines which are basically made using that design. So that will be referred to as that class of submarine. For example, all the indigenously built nuclear submarines being constructed in India, you will hear about them being referred to as the Arihant class of submarines. Okay. Rohit, it doesn't breach uh, international law regarding nuclear technology sharing. So that is an issue which China is raising that no, it does not breach a law as per se. But then China has been raising this issue continuously that look, you are sharing stealth technology, nuclear technology. What is the guarantee that from Australia, it will not go to a rogue nation? or any other country might not steal it. But the argument from the other side of UK and US is very simple. 
their argument is look we are not giving a submarine which has got nuclear weapons we are simply giving submarines which has got nuclear technology having said that it is still a very significant technology a technology which many countries have not managed to master even in india's case when we talk about our nuclear submarines that is the arihant class of submarines they are nuclear but then they are not stealthy it is said that the arihant class of submarines they make a lot of noise underwater and they are very easy to detect so that is why the virginia class submarines they are a superior technology and it will be one of the most superior technology available in the region of indian ocean okay i hope this topic is now clear and I hope you will be able to write answers with regards to this topic. Now coming to another topic that is Brahmapuram as a policy game changer for Kerala. So this is again appearing in the page 6 of the Delhi edition and this is a follow up story to the Kochi landfill fire. Now a brief background of it. So landfill in the region of Kochi caught fire because of the high amount of heat which is produced in these landfills and because of the mixing of biodegradable and non-biodegradable waste that is why it caught fire and that led to a lot of smoke lot of materials being emitted into the sky due to which the schools were closed down people moved out of Kochi even today you have people moving out of Kochi moving to distant areas just till the point of time that the air situation normalizes so that they can return back to their home so this is something that we need to take note of with a strictest of the policy measure how and why the reason for why is very simple we are approaching the summer season and thereby this particular summer season it is expected it is estimated is going to be very harsh we have such landfills all across the country and each of them they start acting as a ticking bomb each of them can go off at any point of time and that particular city will then be suffering from huge amount of pollute, pollution and pollutants which are present so here in this article the author has basically analyzed the various different aspects for example the immediate impacts created and carried out by this burning so first of all there has been a significant damage to the biodiversity now because when you have these landfills which are burning so you have all kinds of materials which end up burning they release lot of carcinogens in the air and what is carcinogen carcinogen is a cancer causing agent a cancer causing pollutant that you come across so a lot of carcinogens are released in the air but humans we humans we can shut our doors and windows we can even have the option of let's say moving out of Kochi for a few days and coming back but what about the individual animals and particularly the bird species we have to understand that Kerala is a particularly unique and a fragile ecosystem it is first of all a coastal area which has got a lot of backwaters the presence of backwaters that provides a safe refuge for many of the migratory bird species as well now these bird species the exact damage has still not been measured till now but it is estimated many of these bird species would have perished due to this fire and that is a risk we cannot afford to take going ahead into the future then Kerala's name as a tourist destination gets tarnished across the globe if you look at the famous catch lines then incredible India is obviously one of those but then very next to that comes God's own country that is Kerala and that is devised by Kerala tourism now you cannot have this kind of a pollution and at the same time say that this is the God's own country so when that tourism gets tarnished and in Kerala the tourism is largely based on ecotourism in a way you have the kind of backwater boats and the backwater safaris which happen right you have very significantly large plantations where the greenery is present and is appreciated so if the environment and ecology is damaged there is a huge 
economic loss. And we have to understand that the entire industry of tourism operates on the aspect of reputation. What is your reputation out in the market? If you are reputed for being a polluted country, obviously the number of tourists which come to your country will be less. If you are reputed to have, be a country where frequently there can be fires and a lot of smoke, then again the tourism suffers. Take the case of Australia. Australia again, Visit Australia is a tourism tag which is famous all across the globe. Now, whenever there is a wildfire incident which happens in Australia, which generally is observed in the month of November to December, you would observe that in the next coming years, for the couple of years, the number of tourists who come there significantly reduces. This has been observed in 2019-20. After that, the COVID pandemic came. So that is where the tourism and the impact on it is experienced long term. Now, here... The article also stresses about the balance in between economic growth versus nature. How and why? So basically, here it is said that there is a failure to see that economic growth and thus the consumption which is led by the economic growth. How is that balancing against nature? In the region of Kerala, we have been observing a significant spate of urbanization which has been happening, a very rapid urbanization which is happening. And that rapid urbanization is putting to threat very critical ecosystems which are present. And nature itself has a very limited capacity to be used and also to regenerate, to absorb everything that we throw and to give us back. So the ecosystem services as it is referred to, the ecosystem pro uh, services provided by nature has got its absolute limitation. You cannot proceed beyond than that. Right. And that is where if you have observed or if you uh, follow the, uh, the current affairs for the past couple of years, you would observe that various tribunal rulings, one made by the National Green Tribunal, also talked about this exponentially growing urbanization trend in the region of Kerala, where many backwaters have been destroyed. Many builders have built large houses, large apartment complexes. Many of them have been brought down as a result of the court order as well. But nonetheless, that creates a lasting damage which cannot be reverted back. So that is something we don't analyze. We think about, okay, there is a fire. We can remove that fire. Everything will be back to normal. But what about those animals, those species, those plants that we lose permanently? Now, there's a failure at the level of the public policy and a failure at the level of the common public as well. How? When we say public policy, what do we mean by that? Public policy basically ends up meaning that you have the decision makers, the bureaucrats, the political leaders and the political leadership. So there has been a failure of the public leadership in the terms of what are the policies that are made. You still do not have a scientific arrangement for the disposal of waste. Leave alone that. Till now, we do not have the exact idea about how much waste is generated in the country. It is still taken as a method of approximation. We have no clue that what is the exact amount of waste which is generated in the country. There is no measure by which we can come at that conclusion. Now, who will do that? Is it the common citizens who will go out in the market or will go out in the landfills and measure that weight on their own? No, it is the work of the municipalities and the municipalities have failed massively in this. Even after we dispose the waste, there has to be a proper segregation which has to be carried out. And it is not something that you and I wish. It is something which is dictated by the law. Which law? Solid waste management rules. Now, that is again a task where the municipal corporations are failing. Then, for the developmental projects, you need to carry out periodic environmental impact assessment. For any kind of urbanization, you need to carry out 
periodic environmental impact assessment. What is this environmental impact assessment? For example, let's say you have created a new landfill where you will dispose the garbage. So you need to carry out an assessment that what will be the impact on the biodiversity on the soil below on the water table below. You need to carry out regular audits as well whether the impact on biodiversity is exactly what we had calculated or is it something which is increasing. So that needs to be done and that is something which is absolutely lacking. So in terms of policy legislations, in terms of how the municipalities are treating the waste, in terms of lack of expansion of municipal facilities, most of the municipal bodies across the country, in fact, they are still functioning based upon the norms which were set by in early 1980s or 1990s. So that is something which needs to change and change as soon as possible. But then there is a failure at the level of common public as well. For common public, we think about it and that is what the article basically throws a light at. That when we think about garbage, garbage that we generate, we think about it that, okay, if I individually throw the garbage on the road, that is not going to cause a lot of pollution. When other people, they throw it, that is something which will cause the pollution. So that is why people most often you will observe when you walk on the road, they will simply be throwing garbage here and there. There is no question of segregation of garbage or waste at source. And that is something which should be done by the citizens. And that is not being followed by the citizens. There is a kind of an approach that I don't have the accountability. I can throw garbage wherever I want. Rest, it is up to the government. We have given them vote. It is the work of the government to take care of that garbage. And that is where the problem is initiated. That is where you have large heaps and piles of garbage developing all across the city. Eventually, out of an emergency measure, the municipality will simply collect all that waste and dump it in a landfill, which will be untreated, which will be left as it is. And that is what will lead to fire incidents. Now, here, Issues at the level of government, if you will observe, then public distribution of goods, services and cash by the state, which is general policy now followed by almost all the state governments, where they also know that public popularity is important. So there is significant amount of the government's resources which are spent on distribution of materials to the public. So public distribution of goods, services and cash, when that is done, obviously, the government will have very little resources, very scarce resources will be left with the government. So in those scarce resources, how is it that we can expect that the entire municipality will be refurbished? How can we have the expectation that the garbage disposal facilities, everything will be to the point? That in itself is an unfair expectation. So that is where the governance models of the day, that needs a discussion. That is what the article talks about. And this is something which has been reiterated by the judiciary as well from time to time, that you are not leaving anything for the municipalities. Barring a few municipalities such as the Bombay Municipal Corporation or rather the, uh, what is referred to as the BMC, then for example the MCD for Municipal Corporation of Delhi for Bangalore. Barring these metro cities, most of the municipalities, they don't have any funds. Whatever money that they get, that is distributed amongst the public. So they don't have anything to improve. Now, there is no arrangement in place for the scientific disposal of garbage or segregation. Poor handling of Im environmental impact assessment. And there you also have to talk about lack of audit system. Audit system. That fair enough. You have carried out the assessment once, but what if once the project comes into full flow, then also you need to carry out the assessment. The ideal case for this is the waste to energy plant, which was built in Okla in Delhi. Now you would be aware that waste to energy plant is the one which is going to convert the garbage into energy of forms, be it charcoal, be it electricity. 
Now, there was the environmental impact assessment which was done for establishing this plant. Everything was given a go-ahead. But when this plant started running, audit was not done. After that, it was found out that so much smoke was being released from this plant. That is when the courts, they stepped in and they ordered the shutdown of this plant. Why? Because it was causing much more pollution than what it was supposed to remove. Now, this can come into picture only if regular audits are conducted. If you don't conduct regular audits, then it is left to the common citizens to take this up in front of the market and in front of the judiciary as well. So that is why there needs to be a proper audit system, maybe by a third party if necessary. Now here, I have put here few of the important key points as given by the Solid Waste Management Rules 2016. Now why this is important for us is because the Solid Waste Management Rules 2016, first of all, has been directly asked in the examination, in the GS examination. But secondly, it is the guidelines defined and determined by these rules which show us a path with regards to how to treat the garbage. So here, segregation of garbage at source, where the garbage at the home, they need to be segregated. Biodegradable waste needs to be separate. Non-biodegradable waste needs to be separately treated. And that separation makes the entire process easier. Then, collect and disposal of sanitary waste, which oftentimes is mixed with the normal waste. And that is what leads to the breeding of diseases. You will find that across these areas where you will find these landfills, a lot of diseases like dengue, malaria, chikungunya, they are very, very predominant. Then, collect back scheme, a kind of, when you generate a kind of a packaging waste, the packaging waste that you get from plastic industry, from your e-commerce industries. So there has to be a collect back scheme so that additional plastics, etc., they are not piled up. In many of these packaging, you have low-grade plastics which are also used, which catch fire very easily. Then, user fee for collection. This has to be done. Even though there are large sections of the public or the population which are against this, that first of all, I'm giving you the garbage and now I'm supposed to give you money as well. So that is where you have to understand that if you want this garbage to be treated, if you want this garbage to be disposed of, and if you want your city to appear clean, you need to provide a token amount for the municipal corporation as well. So that is again provided as per the solid waste management rules, waste processing and treatment and promoting the use of compost. What is compost? So when there is decomposition which happens for the biodegradable waste, that is when they turn into compost and that compost can be used as organic manure. And when you are using compost for organic manure, thereby you are eliminating the use of urea. Please understand, urea is something that we are still deficient in. So in a way, we will be contributing to the economic setup as well. Then promotion of waste to energy needs to happen and needs to be done on a large scale. So that is something which needs to be taken care of. But what is the way forward? Everything is understood, but what is it that we should do going ahead? So accountability should be must for municipal corporations. How many times have you come across a new story that a landfill has caught fire, uh, has caught fire and the municipal corporation members have been fired from that? No, they have almost zero accountability. Regardless of whatever is the impact in the local environment, the municipal corporation simply shrugs it off and walk, walks away. Now that is something which cannot be tolerated for any other job that you do. If you go out and work for any institute, any industry, anywhere, if there is something which goes wrong, which was the responsibility of your department, you will be answerable. But in the case of municipal corporations, even the politicians for that matter, if they don't perform, they shall be answerable to the voters. But the municipal corporation, you will find in various different cities, they are in power for 20 years, 10 years and so on, regardless of all the incidents which happen, which has to be rectified. Then 
garbage segregation by households must become a necessity or a necessary condition which every resident has to fulfill. Adequate funding for garbage clearance as provided by the solid waste management rules. Revisiting the municipal taxes levied on property ownership so that the municipal bodies also have some money. In many of the municipalities you will see that the garbage collectors they have not been paid the salary for maybe six months or maybe even a year because the municipal corporations don't have money. Where that money goes that is a different matter altogether. Periodic independent review or periodic audit may be by a third party but above everything else there needs to be a change in mindset for the common public where the public needs to look at it as your own city. Anything that you throw out in the street, you are polluting your city. Just like we cannot throw anything anywhere in our house, we'd like to keep our houses clean. A similar approach needs to be taken for the cleaning of cities as well. Okay? Now, let's move on to the next question. Right? Um, uh, but now the municipality can share the funds among one another, Sagar. Fair enough, Sagar. But what if none of them have the money? What will they share? And why will a municipal corporation, let's say municipal corporation of Bangalore, why will it want to share its funds with Kochi when Bangalore municipal corporation is already crying that I have less funds? Because the developmental requirements are there with each of the municipalities. Okay. Then um, environmental degradation is because of the lack of, uh, yes, that is true. That is where, Peter, we need to have a change in mindset as well. Why are they short of funds? Because they don't have any method by which they have to generate funds. And there are political compulsions as well. Municipal corporation posts are very significantly political posts. So there are compulsions in place. Okay. Now, uh, the... 2016 rules followed properly so till now very few areas are there for example Indore, Mysore these are examples where solid waste management rules they are at place and observe the changes that these cities are indicating and these are the examples for the rest of the country so the need of the hour is we need to implement it across okay then there comes another article in editorial that is page 6 of the newspaper relevant for your paper 3. This is basically, I'll give you the context of this article just by looking at who has written this. So it has been written by Charge Day Affairs of the Embassy of China who is posted in India. So that is why you will see in this article a kind of a particular praise which has been given for China. But nonetheless, in this article, there are few things we can extract which is relevant for our examination. How and what is it? And what this article talks about. So when we talk about the context of this article. So this article has been written in the mindset that currently in the present year, India is holding a very significant position in global geopolitics because India is holding the presidentship of G20 as well as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the brainchild of China in a way. It is China-led in a way. So that is where automatically China leaves no stone unturned to say that, look, you are currently the chair of SCO and SCO is our grouping. So that is how democratic we are. But nonetheless, the year 2023, that is a high point in India's diplomacy. And as two neighboring and ancient civilizations with a combined population of close to around 3 billion people, that is not a small amount, 2.8 billion people taken together with the combined estimate of the global population close to around 7 billion, we are very close to representing close to around 35 to 40 percent of the global population alone. India in itself accounts for 17 and a half percent and something very similar is accounted for by China as well. So when you have such large countries, such large populations, oftentimes engaged in consistent tussle, that is something which will never benefit at least India or China 
and also the world in general. Yes, you will have various arms exporters who will make a lot of money by exporting arms to India, by giving some arms to China, but then the, these two countries are going to suffer in the long run. Now here, the article argues that look, regardless of whatever kind of relationship you have with China, there are few learnings that we can take from China. And that is something which should be done. After all, China's growth story has been stupendous. In fact, in the last century almost, no other country has indicated such a stupendous growth journey whereby millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. The economy now is around 18 trillion US dollars. We are setting a goal for what? For becoming a 5 trillion dollar economy. Currently, what is the size of our economy? Currently, we are a $3 trillion economy aiming to achieve $5 trillion maybe by next few years. China as of now is more than five times our size. In the last year, in the last decade alone, China has grown significantly and the economy has expanded by close to around a trillion dollars and more. That is humongous. That is huge. Now here, when you take a look at the China's growth story. So the GDP has registered an annual growth rate of 5.2% over the last five years and an average growth rate of 6.2% over the past decade with the GDP increasing by nearly 70 trillion yuan or renminbi, right? Now, this growth story of China that is something which has not initially or has not come into place immediately uh, in the recent past. This is something which has been happening since the late 70s. At the time when you had Deng Xiaoping who was the premier of China. Since that point of time, China started opening up selectively and bringing various different companies into China and more importantly, China started exporting materials by making cheap goods. And there was an economic reform due to which the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, you would have observed that regularly China grew by double digits. As a result of that, you have more than 100 million people who have been uplifted from the matter of abject poverty. And that is where their per capita income has also risen up very sharply. Then there has been live, uh, improvement in living standards due to which now China has become a large market for luxury goods. Even the luxury uh, manufacturing companies who manufacture apparels and other let's say vehicles, electric vehicles etc. For them China is a lucrative market. We in India, we have still not reached that stage. So there is a lot to learn about how to improve the conditions of so many people at the same time. We have also uplifted many people out of poverty, but we can learn from China. There has been a dominance in global growth in the era between 2013 to 2021. China's contribution to global economic growth was close to 38%. The G7 countries, the so-called economic powerhouses of the world, they contributed only 25%. Alone, China managed 38.6%. So that is again a story which tells us a lot. Now, we know the growth story. But there are certain arguments which have been made why the relations should be better than what they are. So what are the arguments? We have huge bilateral trade and in fact, even though we have a significantly large trade deficit, but nonetheless, you cannot ignore the fact that we have close to around $136 billion worth of bilateral trade with China only in the year 2022. This despite the fact that you can basically place restrictions on certain Chinese companies from coming into India and so on, but still that bilateral trade is huge. Then it can aid to uh, and significantly facilitate Make in India initiative by providing raw materials of certain cases. As China's daily wage and daily salary level goes up, the labor market will become costly in China and thereby India can become the next 
manufacturing powerhouse so we can benefit from that then cultural ties so we have cultural and traditional ties in in the form of many things for example buddhism is one of those so that can always be inculcated and promoted and always you will find that china and india they have largely been on the same page when it comes to international groupings with regards to climate biodiversity and so on so they have largely been on the same page and they have acted as a voice of the global south or in a way underdeveloped or less developed nations and also together they can facilitate an Asian century. But then, we in India, we cannot ignore certain basic facts and certain issues which need to be resolved. There is a huge trust deficit. We don't trust the Chinese for anything that they say because they have said something in 59 and we saw what happened in 62. They said something during Doklam and we saw what happened in Galwan. So there is a huge trust deficit and that is further aided by the fact that China explicitly is arming our neighbor that is Pakistan with whom we are not on the friendliest of the terms. So all the modern and the latest equipments that is something which is being provided to our neighboring country more you will find that there is a lot of illegal arms trade which is happening and Chinese arms which are entering Indian market through illegal routes, thereby providing a kind of a social conflict situation and thereby providing conditions which are not conducive for peace. Then, here, opening up of the Chinese market is a major issue faced by the Indian industrialists. While China in a limited manner says that, okay, come trade with us. But China will never open its market for certain select goods. For example, Indian software. There are a lot of restrictions that China pay, places on Indian software. And China waits till the point of time that they are able to develop a competition and then they will introduce into the market. So where is the aspect of free trade here or a free market economy? Same is the case with Basmati rice, same is the case with iron steel, same is the case with almost all the products that you come across. Then, there are various international groupings that have been created, which significantly, if you look at their strategic objectives, they are at conflict with each other. So that is something which needs to be resolved as we move ahead. So if these things are taken care of, ideally, both the countries would benefit significantly and you always have to maintain that posture that both these countries are set to benefit significantly. Even our foreign minister, uh, Minister S. Jayashankar, even he said that the rise of the Asian century will happen only if India and China, they rise together. If one of them rises while the other one does not or is unable to or is there, a, there is a creation of a kind of a conflict scenario, then Asian century will be a distant dream. So that is something we have to be aware of. Okay. How it can aid make in India by providing cheap raw materials in many of the cases. Provision of raw materials. raw materials okay now then we come to the last major topic of the day and that is reservation for women in politics overall there has been and the context of it is that recently there has been a kind of a protest a kind of a dharna going around in jantar mantar in the region of delhi demanding the adoption of women reservation bill in parliament so as to pave way for the reservation of women in the parliament that is the lok sabha and the rajya sabha now we have till now provided reservation to women only in the urban and the local bodies that is the panchayati raj institutions and the urban local bodies and municipalities but that has not translated into reservation in the parliament so that is where this topic is in discussion now now in india we have around 14 percent only around 14 percent of women representing the entire legislature. If you take the entire legislature or the parliament, only 14% of them are women. Even though that is a number which is rising as compared to our own standards, that is a number which is rising.
but it is abysmally low it is very low and you can gain an idea about how low it is by looking at our neighbors Bangladesh Pakistan right Nepal Sri Lanka out of these a couple of countries you can easily point out that they are not the most liberal of the countries but still they have greater women representation so that means it needs to be looked at now this article talks about the historic journey as well when you talk about the political reservation which needs to be provided for women in fact way back in 1931 you had various committees for women and the betterment of women now together they submitted a memorandum to the British Prime Minister where you had leaders like Begum Shah Nawaz and Sarojini Naidu who said that look when you are seeking to provide reservation to women that goes against the basic DNA of equality then you are not treating them equal you are putting them on a pedestal now at that point of time the mindset was very different the mindset was that with the onset of democracy when the freedom comes we will automatically create a system where women are empowered and there won't be a need for reservation at all that is why in the constituent assembly debates it is very well recorded that you had people when they argued for the women reservation while you had a significant majority who were opposing the reservation to be provided to women in legislatures for obvious reasons and that has been a kind of a resistance faced by women across the globe not only in a particular region but across the globe but then you had people openly saying even women leaders saying that look our democracy will mature to a situation where reservation won't be needed so let us not talk about it that is not at all required now the committee however which was set up for the status of women in 1971 that for the first time commented on the declining political representation of women and how it is having an ill effect on the society at large now as a result of that there was a beginning of a political journey a political journey which continues till today basically the national perspective plan for women which was presented in 1988 that talked about the need for providing women representation in the form of reservation in the local bodies as well as in the legislature while legislature at that point of time was a far-fetched dream but the 73rd and the 74th amendments to the constitution regarding the local bodies that is the panchayati raj institutions the municipal corporations and so on they brought in a reservation system whereby one third of the seats for women were reserved in the panchayati raj institutions and one third of the offices of the chairpersons at all levels or in urban local bodies also were reserved so that is where for the first time reservation in local bodies was provided reservation for women in local bodies was provided okay now then within these designated reserved seats as well you need to have one third quota for the SCST women as well so there was a kind of a representation which was aimed at many states if you take a look at such as Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Chhattisgarh and so on they have legally raised this amount of reserved seats to around 50 percent further strengthening the system but then that is where it ends you do not have the representation going on into the parliament if you look at the journey of the women's reservation bill which talks about reservation of women and the seats to be reserved for women legislatures in the parliament thereby you will observe that it has got a very interesting journey by the way so this bill basically proposes to reserve 33 percent of the seats in Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies for women and hereby first this was introduced in the Lok Sabha as 81st amendment way back in 1996 when you had H.D. Devagoda, he was the Prime Minister of the country. At that point of time, it was introduced. It could not be passed.
But because this issue had the support of all the major political parties, including the BJP, the Congress, everyone, the major ones, they were in support of that. That is when in 1998, you had the late Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, his government introduced this bill. But it was something which was telecast on national television at that point of time, whereby you had member of a particular political party. He walked up or walked up to the well of the house and very famously tore up the bill. That is how much few sections they were against the bill. Then again, this bill was reintroduced in 99, 2002, 2003. It could not be passed. So this government introduced it four times could not be passed then the next government led by the ex prime minister dr manmohan singh that also introduced the bill in rajya sabha in fact in the rajya sabha this bill was passed by an overwhelming majority of 186 to 1 but then this bill was never introduced in lok sabha and the reason was many of the political parties they were very stringently against the reservation to be provided to women in fact you have the very famous uh, speech in a way infamous speech if you can term it by uh, late Sri Sharad Yadav who at that point of time was the president of uh, Janta Dal United he said that we cannot provide or we cannot let women with short hairs tell us how to run the country and that is as shameful as it could get at that point of time. So that is where eventually this particular bill was not, never introduced into the Lok Sabha. And because it was never introduced into the Lok Sabha, after this particular Lok Sabha was dissolved, then this bill was never raised. The current government had also introduced or talked about the passage of this bill in their manifesto as well. But till now, there has not been a concrete action which has been taken. That is why protests are being conducted at Jantar Mantar. Now, what are the arguments which need to be provided? Why we need the bill? So the arguments for the bill is basically political parties, they are inherently patriarchal. Patriarchal means male dominated. So for a woman to find the representation and to find a foothold in the present day political parties, it is a very difficult task. It is almost equivalent to being impossible. So that is why you need to provide some kind of facility to have them representing the legislatures. Then gross under representation of the women population in the country. They can fight for issues which are oftentimes otherwise ignored, for example, discrimination, crimes against women. These are the issues that they can talk about. Now, evidences have also indicated by that in many of the urban local bodies, and this is a research which has been carried out by Esther Duflo, right? So the one who is a Nobel laureate in economics. So Esther Duflo, basically in a research has found out that even though in many of the Panchayati Raj systems and institutions, the women, they are mere rubber stamps, so to say, and it is their husbands or their father who run the show. But still, there is a greater allocation of funds in these regions to public goods and public services such as sanitation, drinking water facility, less misutilization of fund. And that is something which always benefits the society in the long run. So that is where it will also be able to fight the discrimination and crime against women in terms of the mindset and also the patriarchal mindset of the society that is still as patriarchal as maybe 10 years back. And that will change only when we have women in considerable roles of power. In fact, UPSC had also given this as an essay question. If you recall, UPSC had asked this as an essay topic where the candidates were supposed to write an essay on the topic, what if women rule the world? That was again related to the Women Reservation Bill. But again, nonetheless, there are few challenges which lie in our way. What are those challenges? First of all, the idea runs counter to the aspect of equality. Now, obviously, equality as enshrined in part three of our constitution that is the fundamental right section of our constitution it talks about the fact that see you have to treat everyone equally and give everyone equal opportunities so let's say 
a section of population that is socially backward etc you can provide them with a level of reservation so that they are elevated to a equal opportunity level but women are not a homogeneous group it is not as if all the women across the country they represent a oneness even in them you have religion you have caste you have tribes so thereby you cannot treat women as one group and then ignore the caste groupings and the caste realities as well so that is why providing reservation here that is where it has been complicated by the policy makers the issue is not complex it has been made a bit more complex now reservation of seats can restrict the choice to the voters that is an also that is also an argument that you can make if let's say a political party does not have enough women representation thereby in a particular seat in your district maybe you are forced to choose someone who might not be that good a candidate but again the counter argument is nonetheless we have to accept the reality that we are not electing the perfect gems even today so they this has to start someday and somewhere then there is also a possibility that because of the ingrained patriarchal mindset that the society has it might turn out to be just another rubber stamp case right just like you will observe in many of the areas the panchayati raj institutions the women heads in those institutions you, the, even though they are the ones who will head the institution because that seat is reserved but their husbands they will openly flout it on their vehicles as the husband of the panchayat or the panchayat or the sarpanch chairman and that is where this possibility even arises in the case of assembly state assemblies and the parliament as well so these are the arguments which can be made against it but nonetheless there are enough arguments to be made that why this bill should be passed yes sarpanch pati as it is referred to okay now then we come to couple of topics with regards to the prelims so here eurasian otter raises hope for jnk stream so this talks about one of the stream which mixes and meets with river chenab and there you have the sighting of eurasian otter now for prelims perspective you need to know which stream is mentioned so it is the niru river that is a tributary of river chenab right and that joins chenab at pul doda in the doda district of jammu and kashmir and here another important trivia for prelims that gupt ganga temple that is again situated on the river which is in discussion on the river in which the otter has been sighted now with regards to otter otter is as per the iucn red list as per the iucn red list it is regarded as near threatened okay it is regarded as being near threatened at the same time what another thing that is relevant for your prelims perspective is that otter belongs to a kind of an indicator species now what do we mean when we say indicator species so indicator species are those group of species or organisms which give you an idea about the health of the ecosystem so otters will only be found if the water is pure and if the water is clean otters won't be found in impure water so that is why they belong to the category of indicator species so you need to know what indicator species are it is also something which is categorized as flagship species what is a flagship species these are those organisms or species which basically they become a mascot or a symbol for conservation or for larger purposes so otters also are a mascot for cleaner aquatic environment particularly fresh water environment that is where otters have become a kind of a global symbol of sort so that is where you need to know what indicator species are and what flagship species are then 
a brief news with regards to the Chameli Devi award which has been given. Now here for examination for prelims in UPSC, you don't get asked the question that who was given this award per se. But nonetheless, if you take a look at it, then here again, you will observe that Dhanya Rajendran, she was provided with this award. And this is an award you have to know which is provided in which area. It is provided in the area of extraordinary journalism, right? So that is something which you have to know. So meticulous reportage data reflecting not only individual merit, but the pursuit of committed journalism. So that is where the Chameli Devi award is related to the field of journalism. That is something relevant for your prelims. Then resolution introduced in US Senate on MacMohan line. So you have the US Senate basically uh, there you had a resolution which was introduced. Now what is that MacMohan line? MacMohan line basically represents the boundary between Tibet and British India as agreed upon by the maps as per the 1914 Shimla Convention. But then Tibet and India that is where the map that we consider as the border of Arunachal Pradesh. But China does not agree to it. China simply says that look, you might the British India reached an agreement with Tibet, we never reached an agreement with British India. So why we, should we follow it? So that is why China lays its claim on Arunachal Pradesh as well, which it considers as southern part of Tibet itself. But we in India, we say that MacMohan line is the international border. Nobody believes that till now. Now, this is an initiation of a process whereby if, let's suppose, United States give recog gives recognition to this MacMohan line, thereby you will have lot of nations, lot of members of the international order, all of them can recognize this as international border. And that will be a momentous step when it comes to India securing its border because this border is heavily disputed. This is again a region where recently it is in this area close to Sundarong Chu and that is where even from there you get an access to the region of Tawang. This was a hotspot even during 1962 war. So in that region of Longju also you have ingre ingressions which are observed in the region of Sundarongshu also. You have Chinese People Liberation Army which do come in and that is where India suffers frequent incursions. So once this is declared as international border and that will come into process once United States provides its recognition. But still that is some way to go. So for prelims perspective you need to know what MacMohan line is and where it is. So it is the border around Arunachal Pradesh. Now, after this, you have another one important for your prelims that is state identified for PM textile scheme to be named soon where the minister has said that we will be announcing the states which will benefit from the PM textile scheme or where we will set up these textile parks. So here for the prelims perspective, you need to be aware about the PM Mitra, right? What are these? So PM Mitra is something that you need to know. First of all, you need to know that what is it related to? It is related to setting up of textile park. So you have seven mega integrated textile region and apparel. These textile parks will be set up in various different states. That can basically be a refurbishment of an existing textile industrial region or a new textile region being set up independently. So it can be a mixture of both of them. Now there it is motivated by the 5F vision. This also you need to be aware that is farm to fiber because the textiles be it cotton, jute, anything First of all, it is grown in farm, you convert it into fiber, then fiber, you take it to factory, factory to fashion, and then fashion to foreign, that is international market. So this is the 5F related to PM Mitra. You can have questions regarding that 5F is associated with which of these schemes, right? So this integrated vision will help the growth of textile sector. And why this is important is, Textile sector is one of the larger employee ge employment generators in the entire country. It generates a lot of employment in the country. And then another important trivia for your exam. This lies under textile ministry. 
okay so that concludes the discussion for the day and we have a couple of main type of question which can be asked discuss the utility of AUKUS as a grouping in the face of changing global geopolitics so try to write that in 10 marks 150 words so here you have to talk about in the introduction part what do you mean by AUKUS why it has come into place and also then you have to talk about the implications that whether it will lead to increased security in the Indo-Pacific region, whether it will lead to increased polarization and division of countries, that is something you have to analyze. And in conclusion, try to write it in a positive aspect, give it a positive spin, talk about the fact that how eventually dialogue and diplomacy is the way forward rather than military groupings as has been observed in various other instances from CETO, CENTO, NATO. In all these we have seen that military groupings have failed in the long run. While in the short run it favors the growth of global arms industry but in the long run it fails. Then the issue of women's reservation needs a larger public consensus. Elaborate upon the statement by tracing the journey of the reservation bill for women. So this is something we have discussed. So this you can write in 15 marks, 250 words. So here you have to talk about the change in mindset which is required. Why is it that we need to ensure reservation of women? At the same time, the challenges that need to be overcome. So that is going to be all from our side today. And that is going to be the discussion for today. Again, I would like to remind you, please do take up the multiple choice questions which uh, are put up in our Telegram channel, the link for which you will find below. And that is how you can assess your understanding level as well. If you like the video, please don't forget to click on the like, share and the subscribe button and leave a comment behind with regards to how you like the content of the video. So that will be all. Thank you. Goodbye.